Welcome to the Nightbird Radio Podcast. I'm Timothy Saylor, and I'm going to be your host this evening as we sound out the subconscious, navigate the nocturnal, and explore the farthest reaches of our experience. Coming at you from the rolling foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the Great Forest, deep in the heart of the Kali Yuga, this is Radio for the Hauntological Turn. And welcome back, Nightbirds. It's great to have you back. I've got an excellent show for you this evening. We have the honor and the privilege of being joined by Sharif Clark. Sharif is a tarot consultant and a magical practitioner, and we had a great conversation about grimoire magic, touching on topics like ritual purification, how to write a petition, spiritual diplomacy, and so much more. We talked mostly about working with a few specific books, but I think the information and experience he shares can be applied to a wide range of operations. But I'll let him speak for himself. So without further ado, here's the conversation. Sharif, welcome to the Nightbird Podcast. We're glad to have you on. How are you doing great, tonight? Great to be here, man. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling electric. Well, we're really excited to have you. I know <laughs> we had a really good conversation on the phone leading yeah. up to this. So yeah. um, I'm really excited to talk to you. This is going to be great. So mm -hmm. let's just jump into it real quick. Um, let's do it. If you want to give me, you know, any of your background of how you got into this or just yep. any context that would be useful for maybe your early life or kind of what led you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. I'll give you the short version, bro. Um, so I, I started to get into the occult um, when I was around 20. Um, and it kind of started with, I had this summer with, with like somebody introduced me to this. I met, well, first off, I, I was in college and I was, I was selling pot at the time. And, right. I, and I had, I had ran into some kid, you know, who just transferred to my school and, you know, he, we ran into one another and he's like, yo, come through, I want to cop something off you. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I came through to his room and then we just have one of those like super deep weed conversations where you talk about the fucking universe and all sorts of shit. Um, and he put me onto psychism and he actually showed me how to read. He, he's the person who introduced me to the tarot actually. Um, but I'll never forget, you know, we were, we were smoking, we were talking and I had this experience. Like it was like this weird experience where like we were talking and then all of a sudden everything stopped and I felt this like lukewarm liquid sensation enter the soles of my feet and then come up through the top of my head. And I was just smiling profusely for like, I don't know how long it lasted. It feels like it lasted for a while, but I would say it lasted for maybe like five seconds or something like that. And I was like, yo, what the fuck was that? What was that? Because I've never experienced anything like that. We're not even like doing hard drugs and shit, but that was a straight up encounter of some sort. Right. And that that sort of led me down the path. And, you know, I, I started to look into psychism, which then led me to Wicca. And I really wasn't feeling Wicca too much. But from there, um, you know, I found chaos magic. And um, I I remember going to Barnes & Noble in the town that I went to school in Utica, New York. And I bought a copy of the Disinformation Guide to Magic and the Occult. And I read it like I was like devouring that shit, you know. And I started, you know, practicing, right, making sigils for dumb shit. You know, I think my first sigil was for like, a thousand dollars or something. And then I ended up getting a, my first credit card limit was like a thousand dollars. And I was like, Oh shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this shit works. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so then that eventually, you know, that, that eventually led to um, me becoming a Freemason at that time. I had a friend on campus who was a, he was actually an older dude. I mean, he was in his like thirties or like late thirties or forties, you know, um, and he was a Mason and he introduced me to some Masons up in Utica and I became a Freemason. Um, and then eventually from there, I came across Dion Fortune's Mystical Kabbalah. And that that book permanently changed my life. You know, I know she's kind of a controversial figure and 
you know, all of that. But that book really did it for me. And I was like, yo, I got to find, I got to find like an initiatory order. I got to find like a golden dawn order or something. So one thing led to another. um, And I end up starting to get into the writings of Crowley. Um, Specifically, I got into the Thoth deck because I had a dream about the art card. And I woke up from that dream, like, I got to get that tarot deck. So I got that tarot deck. And then I, I bought like one of, I forget the name of the book. It's one of the books that Lon Milo Duquette wrote about the Lima and Crowley and stuff. And I remember, um, I was like, all right, this the Lima, you know, I, I remember being shook, you know what I mean? Cause like you see all this shit about Crowley, Crowley's crazy. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I don't know if I want to get into this Thelemic shit, this shit, I have no idea, you know? Um, so I quote eased into it a little bit, <laughs> like little do like, I mean, thinking back on it now, I'm just like, I don't know what I was afraid of, but it just seemed like scary as fuck back then. Um, so, uh, I, I remember I actually filled out an application to attend an OTO Gnostic mass that was taking place in Queens, New York. They accepted, they sent me the direct, they sent me the instructions, they sent me the address and I went and I couldn't find the lodge. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, that's weird, you know? So I was kind of like bummed. And I went home that day. And then I was like, I wonder if there's any other Thelemic groups in in New York. And I found the Iowa study group. And I had sent an email like, hey, I'm interested in Thelema. Looking, uh, like to connect with some people. And they got back to me right away. And I got invited to... um, an Iowa study group meeting back in like 2005, I think. This was like 2005, man. Um, so I started to go to the Iowa study group and eventually, um, you know, I expressed interest in becoming a, I, the, the people who were running the Iowa study group were members of the Temple of the Lima um, that was, that was um, run by Jim Eshelman. And so, um, so I applied for membership I got accepted. And in December of 2006, I got initiated into the Temple of the Lima. And I've been a member ever since. You know, I left for a little while, like I was going hard with my work. And, you know, one thing led to another. I got discouraged. I left the order for a little bit. I would say I left the order for like a year and a half. And then I came back around 2008, 2009 rejoined and i've been a member since 2000 you know really since 2006 but i rejoined the order in 2009 and um you know uh worked the you know work and and still working the system and around 2017 uh i started to get into spirit-based magic and um it started with um with reconnecting with chaos magic. Interestingly, I I found Gordon White's rune soup website um, and a lot of his articles on sigil magic. And then I ended up buying his chaos protocols and, you know, doing some stuff from that. And in the chaos protocols, he talks about, um, I think he mentions Jake Stratton Kent a couple of times in the chaos protocol. So then I'm like, yo, who's this Jake Stratton Kent dude? Looked up Jake. And then I, f- I found out about Jake's Encyclopedia Goetica. Fucking bought all those books. <laughs> Just was like, fuck it. Bought the books. And um, I was interested in uh, the true grimoire. Uh, so I started like ordering shit, you know, buying shit on Amazon at the right planetary hour and all that shit. And then some cool stuff happened. Like I got like, as I was acquiring like the materials and stuff, I had the experience like the spirits might have been meeting me halfway because there was this shit that was happening. Like I got hit off with a couple thousand dollars out of the blue. Um, you know, I ran into somebody who I knew um, and it came to light that they worked at an art school and they had they had access to like a large printer. So I sent them up an image of the of like the circle. <laughs> from the Verum and they printed out a copy of the, the circle from the Verum on like canvas for me, you know? So I was just like, Oh shit, you know, shit's, 
this like something's happening here, you know? Um, but then like, I kind of got into my, I got into my head a little bit and I'd never really, I never actually got to the place where I was working with the system proper, you know, um, there's an interme- inter- intermediary spirit in that system named Skirlin, you know, so I, I did some shit with Skirlin called Skirlin a couple of times. And, um, but I never got to the place where I was like, um, working with those spirits. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden I found myself in a really fucked up financial, um, situation and I needed to get out of that shit quick. And I was trying to look for like the fastest kind of magic that I can do to get myself out of that jam. And I found this book called demons of magic by this dude, Gordon Winterfield. And the, I don't know if he was part of like the gallery of magic. There was some other folks that was called the gallery of magic that was releasing books, you know, but I was like, yo, fuck it. I don't give a fuck. I don't have to buy all of these um, expensive tools, whatever. This is really simple. So um, I used that book and I, um, I, uh, I did a petition to the spirit uh, Gremory and about a month and a half after I did the petition, I got a, I got exactly what I asked for. Like my financial situation completely turned around in a matter of like 24 hours. And I went from like basically getting paid and having my whole entire paycheck taken from me because of my bills at the time to like, I was able to, you know, um, get like some debt relief, like some much needed debt relief. You know, I was able to rearrange some shit with my student loans and you know, I had a family member reach out to me out of the blue and they were giving me like a few hundred dollars a month for like a year and a half, you know, which was like huge, you know? So I'm like, all right, this spirit, this shit works, you know, this shit works. I ended up taking a lot of different, taking a lot of different courses between like 2018 and um, 2019, you know, a bunch of Jason Miller courses, I don't know if you know Mal Strange fellow. I took his four Kings course. That shit was dope. But shit really, really like started to take off. Um, I want to say March of or sometime around like March, April of 2020. Um, Gordon, Gordon White um, launched his angel magic course. I think it was actually, actually 2021. I think it was the beginning of 2021. But um, he launched his angel magic course. You know, I was doing the Praxis assignments in that course. And there was one, there was one assignment where you had to make like something from the PGM with, you had to create like this weird crown with like bay leaves on it. And you had to like write these, uh, the names of like the the Zodiac, but in Greek, um, and the intention of the ritual was to establish contact with an angel of the Pleiades named uh, Zizabal. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. It's like Zizabal or something like that. So I did that shit and I had this crazy dream where I'm like, I'm in this, I don't know where I'm at. I'm someplace. I'm, I'm like indoors and there's this woman that's there. And she has like the face, her face kind of looks like a bird. And she was kind of like an auntie figure to me in the dream. And I remember she like sang a song for me. And I was like, oh my God, that's like, she let me hear a song that she made. And I was like, oh my God, that's you. And then um, she was walking away. And then I was like, wait a second, like, I need a book from you. And she walked away and she was like, there's there's, there's, there's tarot over there, like pointing in some direction. Then I was like, what the fuck? So I woke up from the dream. You know, I talked to Mo, who you interviewed. That's my homie. You know, talk to him. And all of a sudden we start like doing all of this gamatria. And the bottom line is we got like, we came up with this name of the spirit that came, that showed itself in the dream. And the the name was like uh, Gabdar Pakat or something like that. But when you translate it into Hebrew, when you translate it from Hebrew to English, um, the name meant pearl. 
And I had, when I was young, I had a babysitter um, who her name was Ida Pearl. And so I was like, holy fucking shit. Like that's, that was who visited me in the dream, you know? And I, I knew that because in the instructions of the ritual, it says that the angel will show itself in the form of a friend. And so that, yeah. So like, so I had this dream where I had this woman that I had like this kinship with and this really deep connection with. And, um, we were bugging out, bro. We were like, yo, you know, there was a bunch of, there was like, like basically there were like a bunch of rune soup members that were, that were involved in helping sort of decode the name, you know? And so when they all found out, like, they were like, holy shit, you know? So, so that was like a big deal for me because it, it was such a strong enough magical result that it, it kept me going. So shortly after that, you know, since I've, since I've been like trying to work with the, with the Verum or at least getting, trying to get my shit together so I could work with the Verum, um, I decided to take, take a look at the Verum with fresh eyes because there are a couple of angels in, in that manuscript, you know, for the most part, people, when they work with the Verum, you know, they, they establish communication with the intermediary spirit, and then they pick a demon that they're going to make a pact with or whatever. But coming out of the angel magic course, I was like, all right, yo, so like, but what if I try to fuck with these angels instead, you know, because I don't have everything that I need to actually do a full ceremony, but at the, I could, I could, I could gather what I need to do this one operation called the divination by word of Uriel. So sometime around April of last year, I did, I did that ritual and I I went to Uriel and I'm like, look, just show me how to show me how to like perform the art of the magic that's in the, in the Verum. And I mean, when I did the ritual, I was expecting like the angel to physically show up because in the, the way that the instructions are written, you know, you do some preparations. The room needs to be set up a certain way. It's very simple, very simple setup, three candles, um, a glass of water. And it says, you know, you call the angel, the angel will come. If the angel doesn't come, it'll give you an answer in your dreams. And if you don't get an answer in your dreams, leave the room, come back the next day, leave a pen and paper in the, on the table. And the answer is going to be on the, on the pen, on the, on the sheet of paper when you come back. So I was, I was reading that literally, but what ended up happening was after I did that ritual, somehow I got inspired to watch the movie, um, Arrival. Like that was like the first thing that I got inspired to do. And, and as I was watching the movie, it dawned on me like, okay, what's being, what's, what this angel is showing me is you're going to be communicating with an entity that doesn't talk your language. You got to learn how to speak its language. You know what I mean? Like you got to Like, this is not going to be a straightforward, like how you and I are talking. Like, right. no, this is going to be a whole nother mode of communication that's going to take place. And, you know, when you work with angels or select, I'm going to say celestial spirits because people get weird when you talk about angels, like they have, there's a, particular stigma or conception. But um, when I talk about, when I may, when I say angels, I'm not talking like about what other, what, what most people think, I, but I am talking about a celestial spirit and they bombard you with dreams and insights. I mean, it's in the Bible, you know what I mean? Sixth and seventh book of Moses um, has a, an amazing, like in the introduction, it talks about this, the, like, essentially like people who are who are like prophetic and they get dreams you know dreams insights visions or whatever so when you're dealing with celestial spirits they're gonna they're gonna come to you in dreams they're gonna give you insights they're gonna give you daydreams like they, they communicate like through visual images so i'm like okay i got the i got the memo i also got like something about um, the way that the, that the experiment itself works. And it's, and it was sort of like 
when you're when you're performing this experiment, you're receiving something like you'll receive a packet of information, but it's like it's like if you can imagine this, like imagine light shining into a body a body of water. You know, some of that light, a majority of that light is going to penetrate to the depths, and there's going to be some of the light that bounces off the surface of the water and shimmers and sparkles, whatever, off the surface of the water. And what you're seeing in your mind is like the equivalent of the light that's bouncing off the the surface of the water. I like that. It calls to mind the prism too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, so I'm like, you know, I'm like, all right, this is great. I record it. I don't really talk about it because this is, you know, this is unverified, you know, but it, it was like, okay, it let, it led me to, you know, it showed me something was working. And then like, I just got, I guess it just came to me in like a, like a, um, like a hunch or something like have Tamaron. And now I'm like that Tamaron, like, I don't know shit about that Tamaron, you know? So I decide to do some investigation and I start looking up they have Tamaron on Joseph Peterson's website, Esoteric Archives. And I buy a copy of the Heptameron. I, um, it was Summoning Spirits by, by someone. I really, I'm really bad at like naming my sources. That's one of the things I'm going to work on. But anyway, I bought a copy of the Heptameron. I bought a copy of the fourth book of Occult Philosophy. Um, and then I started listening to um, podcast episodes of this dude, Adley Nichols who's at least the fucking man, you know, when it comes to the heptameron. <clears throat> so I start studying that tamaron and I, you know, I like, as I'm studying the heptameron, I'm thinking about certain things within the verum, like the timing of a verum operation, which is Tuesday on the hour of Mars. And as I'm, as I'm studying the heptameron and I'm kind of like, Stud- not really studying it in tandem with the Verum, but it started to fill in like the blanks for another way of working with the spirits of the Verum. And one of the another in- one of the insights that I got is like, all right, you call, you work with the Hetamaron because you're gonna call, you're gonna call these spirits of this time and essentially assemble an army because you're like a sovereign that is interacting with another sovereign. So you got to show up with an army, you know, not in case something pops off, but it's like, it's like you're flexing, like, yo, I'm the fucking man. You're the fucking man. Let's sit down. Let's, let's work some shit out. Right. So I make note of that and I don't have any validation for it yet, but I'm looking as this is happening. You know, there's someone that I know that happened to be working on transcribing and translating a manuscript that has the first half of the manuscript is essentially the same hierarchy of spirits as the verum and then the second half of the manuscript is a copy a printed copy of the heptameron so i'm like yo that's fucking crazy i'm not crazy but that's fucking crazy and here's some crazy validation you know and it showed me that okay at one point in history there was at least one person or a, a a few people who were working with these spirits by way, you know, by way of the, of Peter de Bono's um, heptameron. You know, they're calling these spirits using the heptameron. Cool. I got it now. So I end up, um, Adley had a course on the heptameron last summer, took that course. It was dope. And at some point during the course, I reached out to him. You know, I told him about what was happening with the Verum, how I found the Heptameron, you know, and, you know, one thing led to another and, and, you know, he was really gracious enough to, you know, to take me on as like a student of his, you know, um, and I had ordered a bunch of stuff that I needed to work the Heptameron. And at the same time, I wanted to use what I learned in Adley's course to start working with those spirits, even though I wasn't at the place where I was ready to do a full conjuration. So I would do, I would do like daily petitions, you know, I would call, you know, call certain like the spirits of the day. There's a no, numerous spirits that you call when you're working that system, 
you know, but I would call those spirits. And, you know, I asked them to support me in learning the magic of the heptameron, to support me in mastering it, support me in acquiring the tools and everything that I need to practice it. And then shit just started happening. Like I had a trip um, planned to go to Paris. Um, I had to cancel that trip and I had already booked my Airbnb. And I remember doing a petition. I did a petition one day, you know, to, for the, for the money to buy all of the equipment that I needed. And then the next day my trip gets canceled and the funds from that Airbnb get freed up. So I just redirected it to the tools, you know, but I did that a, a few more times with some other shit. And I noticed like every time I would ask these spirits, not every time, not every time I would ask them, but I would do certain petitions and within 24 to 48 hours, like life circumstances would get rearranged so that money that I already spent would come back to me so that I could direct it to funding my uh, work with the Heptameron and getting my shit. Um, so that was going on for about six months because it took me it took me a while to get everything. Um, and then finally, in January, you know, I did my first full um my full working with those with those spirits using an older manuscript of the Heptameron VRL 1115. But you know, I had a homeboy that was in a jam, he was in a legal situation, you know, so I offered to do the operation for him. Um, you know, wrote up a petition, did the operation, he did some shit, and within a few days, like he ran into somebody who Help, like basically was was wanted to play a role in helping him with his case. He ran. He actually ran into a a, a reporter, a, a vice reporter. You know, um, unfortunately, the petition didn't come to fruition. But um, what's interesting is the day, like we put a deadline on the petition, and the day after uh, the deadline, um, what, the police chief of of the police department that he had the legal situation with they had to they, they stepped down you know um which was like all right yo i i can't really chalk that up to i can't fully chalk that shit up to what we what we uh what we were asking for but yo that's wild you know what i mean like the timing yeah, of that, that is crazy it's gonna say the yeah, timing yeah the timing it was crazy given given what we were asking to have happen you know and in some ways, like what we were asking, some aspect of what we were asking to have happened did happen, but it wasn't relevant and it wasn't directed to my whole, like to, to what, you know, it wasn't to the letter of um, what we were asking for, you know, which is a big lesson in and of itself, you know, um, you know, but since then I've, I've gone on to do um, two more operations. I'm trying to get to the part, a point where I'm basically doing like two of these per lunar cycle. And I just did one in March. I did one for a family member to support them with, with getting a job. And within 24 hours, somebody that, that was offering a job, but offering them a job at one point, but lost contact with them. Um, that person reached out out of the blue and was like, yo, I want to hire you. And then they got offered an interview, you know, a couple of days later, you know, so that shit still that's just still playing out. But, um, but that's basically like the, the shortest version of my story from how I got started to where I'm at right now. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love hearing that. It's yeah. such a great story. And thanks, man. It's just really cool to hear someone with a different sort of experience than me. You know, you're, you've been experienced with, with lodge magic. Yeah. And grimoire magic. Yeah. And, um, not my wheelhouse, but I just, I love hearing about it. And I love hearing about the concrete, tangible effects of doing magic that it can have in someone's life. So let's go on to that yeah. category. I know we, that yeah. was one of the things that you really wanted to talk about. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Practicality results. Yeah. And what are some of the things, the tangible things that people can get or see in their life when mm -hmm. they practice this stuff? Yeah. Well, that's good, man, because... I think it's important that when you're doing magic, like for instance, like a lot of the times when I would do stuff, where I would go to is, did I, did I feel like the ritual work? Did I feel the spirits? Did I feel something, you know? And that's not always the best place to look. Some, like you got to look at what's happening in your life. You know, like did some new shit show up? 
Did you meet somebody new? Did you have a conversation or did you get some information that you didn't have before post ritual? You know, so like where to look like and where I where I think a lot of people, myself included, miss the magic happening is that we go to look internally. We go to look for some sensory experience. Meanwhile, the shit's going on. It's happening in the events that play out in our lives. So I think as a practitioner, one of the skills to develop is to be able to do something, you know, keep in mind the intention of the working that you did, but look for like specific and me- specific measurable outcomes that tell you and inform you that your magic is either working or that your magic's not working. You know, if nothing's happening, nothing's happening. That's not a problem. That's, that's not bad. And that's not bad news. There might be something that you just have to tweak, but where to go to, to, to determine if your shit's working is, you know, more times than not, it's in the events, external events that are taking place post ritual. And that doesn't mean that there aren't some, some types of magic or there, or there aren't some things that people do to sort of augment their experience of reality or augment their experience of themselves. And if that's the case, then that then it would be appropriate to look at how you feel or your thought process or your general experience of living. But if you're doing practical magic, meaning you're doing magic to affect, you know, the world outside of yourself, like we'll just say physical reality, so to speak, then that's where you want to look to determine if your magic's working. So I'm really big on that because sometimes the results are really subtle and sometimes they're very overt. But the important thing is to be able to suspend the judgment enough to actually observe, is this shit working? And without having to like go to great lengths to try to explain the results of something too, because sometimes we want the magic to work so much that it influences the way that we look at what we're doing or we're looking at the outcomes. So we might reach. It serves one to be rigorous in looking at what happened after that ritual and not pass judgment, no matter how trivial something is. And to also keep in mind the degree to which what you asked for actually happened in the in the physical world there's also like this skill in being able to sort of measure all right did 100 percent of what i asked for take place did 73 percent of what i asked for take place did 50 percent of what i asked for take place and be and be truthful about it so that you could use that feedback and do more effective magic you know like i you know i was joking around with a friend of mine I was well, I was half joking, but I was I was dead ass serious. Like, yo, I'm about to start putting all my operations in a spreadsheet. And so when I talk to people, I know I know how if, like I could I could statistically measure my effectiveness based on 20 operations, 20 petitions, 19 of them were this, 15 of them were that, da 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 da. Like I that's just me. I just like getting nerdy like that, you know. But It's like, but it's like a, it's like, um, it's like an athlete, you know, how can you tell how effective an athlete is if you don't statistically measure, you know, the points that they score per game, the number of times they, like, if we're talking basketball, like if you don't measure how many times, how many three pointers they make, how many field goals they make, how many free throws they make, you know, how many, how much time do they hold the ball? How many times they pass the ball? You can't tell how effective of a player, of a performer that they are, unless you can get to the point where you can measure the performance. And I think that's very important when it comes to doing magic. Very cool. Very cool. Which gets us, um, I'm kind of jumping around here. Basically. Yeah, that's, that's, good, that's okay. That's perfect, bro. Um, Cause there's a word you mentioned and mm-hmm. we talked about it. Um, and I know we wanted to touch on it, but the idea of conversation. Yes. And ritual. Yes. And out of ritual types of communication. Could you go into yeah. to more of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in every ritual, not every ritual, but depending on what you're doing, um, there's things that you say and there's things that you do, you know. So you could say that there is a verbal conversation that's happening 
And then there's a nonverbal conversation that's happening with the ritual gestures composing the, the, the nonverbal part of the conversation that's happening. And if we're dealing with non-physical entities that somehow are able to receive these communications, then that's also something that's important for us to take into consideration, you know, and it took me, it took me a while. Like I still, when I look at the ritual of the, you know, when I look at, when I look through VRL 1115 and I'm studying, you know, I'm, I'm studying, I'm getting ready to, to do a conjuration, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what, I'm not just looking at what is the operator saying. I'm also looking at what is the operator doing? What, and what does that communicate? So there's this whole realm of communication that's taking place verbally and non-verbally in the form of, of a ritual. It makes me think about what you said earlier too. And it's another thing that we talked about is um, when you said you're building an army to go meet with this spirit, it's diplomacy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. If, if you're, if you're going to someone for a diplomatic uh, communique, everything you do is going to be being read. Right. And, and you're going to read everything they do. Right. Exactly. Just I like, really like you, that. Yeah. Like it just exact, like exactly. If you met someone in person and you sat down with them and you're, yeah, yeah you're talking, but there's also their body language, your body language that are sending cues, you know, that give, that tell you how the conversation is going. And then there's what's actually there as a presence, you know, there's what you're actually present to as well. That, that comes out of that, like that quote conversation that's happening you know, that dialogue that's happening as well. And, um, you know, there was, there was nonverbal cues and j- just like when you meet with somebody in person, you know, that you, that the operator needs to take into consideration. And this is, this is what I was actually going to say. And this was um, even more validation for me because when I, before, when I got that insight, I didn't read any of the conjurations within the Heptameron. I didn't know, the ritual floor, anything like that. But it literally says that like right before you start to call the aerial spirits, because a lot of people think with the Heptameron, you're just working with angels, you know, and that's, you got to understand you're, 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 you're working with, you know, celestial entities so that you could ultimately get them to bring terrestrial spirits to you and have those terrestrial spirits and Catholic spirits or whatever, have those spirits go handle your business for you, you know? Um, And uh, the only reason why I'm harping on the Heptameron is because that's, that's like my, that's my primary, that's my jam right now. That's, that's, I'm all in with that, you know? So that, and that's ultimately, that's also where I'm deriving a lot of my feedback with, um, you know, with regards to the way that some of this stuff works, but it's right there. It's right there in the ritual script, man. You literally say, you know, I don't know what it says verbatim, but you literally tell those angels, like, look, I'm calling you, like, have have these angels. I want a thousand angels in my service. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you do that to like all four parts of the world. So that for me was even more validation that this ritual with Uriel yielded some crazy results. And it took, it didn't all come like it, like all the results didn't play out in one day, you know, it took like months, like, like, like a breadcrumb trail over months, you know, going on a year now, you know what I'm saying? When you're, when you're performing certain magic, like you, you are, you're a sovereign and the diplomacy is of utmost importance and you have to know when to press, you know, like press the line, you know, and assert your authority and when to, when not to do that, when it's inappropriate to do that and take, you know, take, they're like they are the ones that are gonna um take the lead and you gotta follow their lead. But you won't know that if if you if you can't foster a, a the, the type of diplomacy that informs you on what you need to do. So it's and it's a dance. You don't know until you're in the circle and you're kind of like, all right, uh <laughs> what's next here? I called you, you're not here yet. <laughs> you know, I did all this shit for you, bro. Like, come through, you know, or like, yo. I did not eat for a long time, you know, to come talk to you today, like get your ass here, you know? Um, And then sometimes you got to be sweet, like, yo, you know, come through, I'm lighting some more incense for you. You know what I mean? Um, But you learn all of that stuff. You learn all of that stuff 
through the doing of the magic. You know what I mean? And there's yeah. there's like no one there's no one way to do it, which you know, like like we talked about before. You know, we were talking about pizza. How I was telling you about you know one of my favorite shows, which is Ugly Delicious. There's a whole episode about pizza. You get all these people making pizza all throughout the world. You know, it's pizza, but the way that they do it over in Norway is different than how it's done in Italy and how they, how it's done in certain parts of Italy is different than how it's done in America, but they're still making pizza, you know? So there's no, there's no like one size fits all approach to the shit, you know, but if you're going to do it, you know, just do it with the understanding that, um, that you will have to learn some additional skills that you didn't realize before you started doing it. And that's fine, you know, and diplomacy, especially, you know, and, and, in a relationship with a non-physical being, it's, it's just as important as it is with a human being. Right. Don't go into it uh, not expecting to make dough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm going to go back to what you were talking about. Um, this has reminded me of another topic that uh, we wanted to touch on. When you yeah. were talking about how to how to collect that data based on the petition that you've that you've come to the spirit with um, yeah. how to calculate that batting average, but you've got to be able to write phrase or frame that petition. So could you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, man, that's, that's critical. That's, it's so critical. Um, so for instance, with, with the operation that I did in January, you know, when it was obvious to us that we weren't going to get what we wanted and that the, that the, that, there was a failure in like in performance outcomes. We'll say it like that. There was a failure in the performance outcomes of the ritual. The first place that I went to was like, how do we write the ritual? How do we write the petition? And what, what actually happened that was related to the way that the petition was worded? You know, um, because it, I had like, like based on the way that things went, I needed to have, I needed to revert back to what was asked for, you know, so I can get the degree to which things happen based on what I asked and things didn't happen based on what I asked, you know? Um, and then in debriefing, you know, debriefing it and talking it over. And I mean, like going deep, you know, um, what I ultimately got to was, this was essentially an individual trying to like, that was trying, that was going up against an organization, you know? So, so there was an, unle- there was like that alone was an uneven playing field, you know? And I didn't take that into consideration. You know, I didn't take into consideration, look, we're, you know, the scope and the size of the target. And then also I went about it thinking that this was, this wasn't a justice working when in fact it wasn't justice working. And my petition didn't reflect the nature of the working. My petition reflected something else. You know, had I been present to the fact that ultimately this was a justice working, I would have worded it differently. And I would have worded it in a way that um, that would have been shorter, sweeter, and would have had much more precise, precise results. So it's really important to, to be clear on what you're what you're asking for and be clear on the petition that you're making. And you, because one, you, you want to like, you, you want to be able to determine, be, you want to be able to easily see, did everything that I asked for happen? You know, did everything that I asked for happen? And then do I really want this result? Is this an outcome that I really want? And because you don't, we don't necessarily know how the magic is going to play out. We also want to be responsible that the magic doesn't unintended, like it doesn't cause unintended harm, excuse me, because that could happen as well. I know it's like a cliche to say, be careful what you wish for, be careful what you ask for. And it, and that, that is true, but it's, it's also, uh, it could also be a guiding principle when you're designing and inventing a petition. What we, you know, the, the true intended result was not necessarily reflected in the petition itself. And I think if I would have had the wherewithal to really, to really like look further into the, the situation that I would have crafted a much different petition. And 
it, it's all speculation. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I, I, you know, as an operator and as somebody with an interest in being effective when doing magic, it's super critical to be mindful of, of wording your petition and wording it in a way that um, that reflects what you want, but not so narrowly and wording it in a way that gives the spirit some room to work in ways that you can't see, but also um, working and like wording it in a way that doesn't cause collateral damage. Or, or if you're doing something that requires damage causes the least amount of collateral damage. Yeah, it really calls to mind. And, you know, I don't know if there's a one-to-one the clarity with which you want to ask a question of the cards. Right. The, cl- right. the clarity that you want to have in your sigil statements. Yep. The clarity that you want in any of your intention statements. Like yep. I, I always, and I, this is probably a cliche too, but it's one that really helped me. I think the hardest thing about magic for me, at least to start off with was what the hell do I want? Yeah. What do yeah, I want? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you exactly. can answer that, you're like, you're most of the way there, I think. Totally, totally, uh, totally. And then, you know, you because because if you have that clear, then not only can I do the operation, whatever that might be, but then I'm also free to to work towards that in the mundane ways that we do it, you know? Like yep. if I'm If I'm working towards getting a job, I'm going to have to apply for jobs. I'm not going to sit on the couch and wait for jobs to come. That might work for some people. And it's probably worked for me, but for the most part, it's better to to make sure I'm, I'm seeing that. Right. And all, and all things. Yeah, absolutely, man. There's two things. Yeah, totally. I agree with you a hundred percent. And there's, there's two things that I want to say. One of the things that you said was clarity in the question that you asked the cards, you know, the way that, you know, so I'm, I'm a consulting tower reader. So, When I work with my clients, I can't read the cards without a question. And sometimes, sometimes the client will, will like, they'll, they'll be talking, they'll talk to me, you know, they'll talk through the scenario with me and then I'll hear the question to ask. And then we bring it to the cards, you know, and the same principle applies with your, with the petitions. And it might actually, it might actually take talking to somebody you know, for people that are like, you know, operant magicians and out there doing all this kind of shit, like it might actually take talking to one of like talking to someone and being like, look, I'm going to do an operation. I need to talk this through. This is what I'm, this is what I'm, this is what I see I want now, you know? So like, let me explain to you what, what I'm ultimately out to do. And, you know, if you hear anything that would, would be good to like for crafting a petition, let me know. You know what I mean? Like there's, you know, it's, this is, this is a creative process, you know, ultimately it's a very creative process. Like we go about it scientific, we can go about it scientifically, but it's a very, it's a creative process. So it's really clear, you know, to have an intended outcome, not like an intention, like, Oh, I'm going to have this intention to be rich and not do shit, you know, but like have an intention, like this is what I'm intending to bring about to bring into, um, I have the will to bring something into existence. You know, I'm going to go about it magically, but I'm also going to go about it through any and every mundane avenue as I possibly can, which one of the things that I, that um, I thought about in between, like from the time that we spoke on the phone to now is, you know, when you're doing an operation for um, the Heptameron or VRL 1115, you know, there's a purification period, you know, there's a purification period. So I was, I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know, it's one thing to like, to do the stuff that's, that the grimoire says to do to purify yourself. But it's another thing to use that time to work on yourself, to become the kind of person who the results are a natural match for. Do you know what I'm saying? I like, really like that. You know, like, like use that time. Like, like, all right, look, you're going to, 
all right, you're not going to have sex. You're going to have to give up food, like booze. You're going to have to like, whatever. All right. That doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing or it doesn't necessarily have to be so limited in scope. Like you're doing that solely because you're going to do a magical operation. Yes, you're still doing the magical operation. And this is, this is the required work that goes into being able to perform the magic. And at the same time, that can be an opportunity to start to identify the things that you need to do in the world, you know, to, to, so that you're also backing the magic up, as Jason Miller would say, you're backing it up, but also you're becoming the kind of person that is a match for what you're asking for. And I think that's important too. And that's, that's like a new, it's like sort of a new idea that came out of the last working that I did because I noticed that after I did that working, you know, I, you know, I was in touch with a family member. So we would, you know, I would, I would tell them, I would be giving them instructions for things to do as well on their end, you know, so that they're not over there, just do me, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, you know, it'd be nice if the, like, and we want the results to just come. That's why we do the magic, like, so that we can, we can ultimately astound ourselves by, you know, shit happening out of nowhere, you know, but I, I think that there's, um, I think that there's some merit to, you know, factoring in personal growth and personal um, alterations so that when you do get what you asked for, you're either able to maintain it. You don't, you don't like, you don't fuck up the results. Um, and that it doesn't feel like you don't, you're not deserving of the results. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, I'm asking for, I'm asking for, you know, a hundred thousand dollar a year fucking job. And I'm going to go, I'm, you know, so I'm going to go take the next few weeks to like get my resume redone. You know, I'm going to go, you know, buy some new clothes. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to exercise, you know, I'm going to do something that is going to give me the experience that I'm not asking for something that is out of my, you know, that's out of my league. And I'm asking for something that's out of my league. And I'm going to meet the the powers that be that are going to go handle the shit that I'm asking for. I'm going to meet them halfway. Just like you, know? you said, they meet you halfway. Exactly. Right. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to another topic that uh, we wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've already said a little bit. I really like what you just said there. So some of the things that that are part of that purification process or part of mm-hmm. that prep that you're talking about, charity, communion, yeah, yeah. confession. Can you talk yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah, man. Yeah. Specifically for, you know, for Heftameron work, Heftameron or Bureau 1115 operation, you know, you're looking at nine days of purifying yourself, you know, with the last three days being the most intense. Um, and what we were talking about was, there are ways that you can, that there are ways of purifying yourself. And although it's important to understand the religious context of what you're doing, um, I like to approach it from like the perspective of, you know, like a performer, you know, and my experience of myself as I'm prepping for this, prepping for this ritual, you know? So like, for instance, I think I was talking about how for my last operation, I really didn't have not the last one, the one prior to that, um, you know, there was a time when I didn't really have, you know, I didn't really have a lot of money and, you know, I was walking down the street. I was kind of feeling, you know, sorry for myself, or whatever. And um, a friend of mine had reached out to me and asked me if they could borrow a small sum of money. And I gave them the money, but in giving them the money, all of like all of a sudden, like my experience of myself was like, I wasn't missing anything. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't lacking anything. Like I had whatever money I had and I didn't have whatever money I didn't have, but that didn't, but I myself wasn't any less of a person as a result of that, you know? Um, and so, so I, 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 I think like purification as lived 
is a it, it's it's like you're ultimately con- creating a condition where you have this experience of being whole and complete, which is why you also confess. You know, now other people might have other opinions, and I don't. I'm not challenging their opinions, but from 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 what I've done and and my experience of going through that process, you know, you're unburdening yourself so that you don't have all of this shit in your mind while you're doing this ritual. Because first off, you need to be able to concentrate. You need to be able to be present. You need to be able to be able to detect things happening in your environment that aren't that's that that don't always happen. And you can't do that if you're concerned about some fucked up shit you did to somebody or some or like some something that you did that you knew that that you didn't that you knew you shouldn't have done because it violated your own personal code. Do you know what I'm saying? So the, the so there's a so as a byproduct of the the spiritual purification work that you do, you end up or the the op, the operator has a chance of giving themselves an experience of being whole and complete, not missing anything, not lacking anything, fully capable of carrying out what they're about to carry out. And it's possible to frame each component of the purification process to be in service of that. Like if you're praying, you know, having your prayers be in service of like, look, I'm restoring, I'm, rest, I'm, I'm taking a restorative action for myself so that I can go forth and go do like create a, like literally cause a miracle, you know, through the, through this ritual that I'm about to do. So it works to have as much of, it works to have, to walk into that circle, knowing yourself as capable of performing this miracle and the spiritual exercises or the exercises that go into the purification, um, can give you that experience of yourself so that it's not weird when you're in the circle. You know what I mean? Weird meaning like, like I'm doing this, but I know it's really not going to work or I'm doing this, but I know I'm a piece of shit. I did, you know, I don't know. Imposter syndrome in the circle. Right. None. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, no, no, you know? So, so that's my, that's my take on the, um, that's my take on going through those, going through those exercises you know, including, including like fasting, you know, including fasting, including abstaining from sex, demonstrating mastery over your physical vehicle, because ultimately you're about to wear, you're about to go put on a vestment and these emblems and carry a sword that all, they all like established the kind of like this symbolic character that is capable of dominance. You know what I mean? Like I'm look, I'm calling, I'm calling God's angels to make some stuff happen on earth. And it, and, and it works for me to, to, to relate to myself as having that kind of power and being able to do that. Not like in an egotistical way, but in a way that, like you said, no trace of imposter syndrome. I'm stepping into the circle. These spirits are coming. They're going to do what I'm going to ask them to do. And that's just how that's going to go. You know, and I prepared for it. I didn't have sex. I didn't drink. I cut out food for a little bit. You know, I had one meal, you know, I demonstrated mastery. I restored my relationship with myself so that I'm now able to, to have these words that I'm about to speak actually mean something. Yeah, that's really cool. And you know, the way I see it too. And I think you'll probably agree with me, but you know, some people might not. And this is again, just my own way of looking at it. Yeah. I think a lot of that stuff is it's the same kind of stuff that I might do if I'm experiencing some kind of blockage and I harp on this a lot, you know, but if the energy isn't flowing through me, if the current isn't flowing through me, then it's blocked. And that could be something as simple as me thinking of, well, you know, I'm trying to call these spirits from a place of righteousness, but I'm remembering this thing I did, like you said, that I'm, Mm -hmm. that's not, that doesn't vibe with my thing. Yeah. It's inconsistent. It's blockage. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cool, man. I like it. Yeah, that's great. We, We talked a little bit about kind of the difference in what it's like to do magic for yourself versus the experience of doing magic 
for someone else. Yeah. Can you talk on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So part of part of why I I started to like when my first couple of operations for the, you know, for um VRL one 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 five were for other people, you know. And part of why I did that is because I know if I if I would have did them for myself, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have taken it as serious. You know, I wouldn't have I I wouldn't have prepared the way that I did. You know, I would have dragged <laughs> dragged my heels. But also, there is something about, you know, there's something, there's some power, like there's something about doing something for like, like doing this work for other people. Like, I think, I think it's great to do magic for yourself, you know, but when you're doing magic for other people, there's a different level of accountability because that person's life is, that person's life is on the line. I don't mean like their life is on the line, like you're going to save their life, you know, but like, obviously, you know, if you're doing something for them, then there's something that's really, really important to them that they're wanting to have happen in their life, you know? And so I feel like there's, there's some, there's, there's something to doing magic from, for other people inside of that context, even if you're doing it for money, you know what I mean? Like I, you know, I didn't excel, like I'm not doing, I didn't do those operations for any money, you know, but, but like, I can tell that the way that I went about the prep, the way that I went about debriefing the rituals, you know, the way that I went about, you know, even communicating, you know, with Adley, because he was the person that I would talk to as I would prepare and, you know, ask questions, get my questions answered, things of that nature, you know? So, and, and also like, like I was like, I was accountable to him. You know what I mean? Like he was somebody who I was like, he, like, it wasn't like, he was like, yo, Sharif, are you going to do the ritual? Yes or no? I'm like, no, that wasn't what it was like. But, but having someone outside of myself to account to had me take the work that much more serious, you know, and take a vested interest in making sure that I'm doing my part so that this person gets this, you know, they get to, they get what they're hoping to get, you know, even though, you know, even though what I, what I, the first operation I did was a failure, you know what I'm saying? Um, there's still a level of accountability that's, that's there that I think is absent when we do magic for ourselves, sometimes depending on the scenario, you know, like sometimes we have big shit going on in our lives and we need the magic to work. So we're not going to screw around, no doubt. you know, but when we're doing it for somebody else, at least from my experience, when I'm doing it for somebody else, you know, I'm um, I'm much more I'm much more likely to take it far, far more serious because I'm I'm wanting I'm wanting this person to either be free of the circumstance that they're trapped in, or get the thing that they want that's going to improve the quality of their life. And I I think there's I think ultimately there's something inherently baked into doing magic for others. You know like like the miracle like the room for miracles is is a lot greater you know than if you're just doing it for yourself not you know not like you can't do magic for yourself you know but like there's something about doing it for other people that just has it be a whole different ball game you know yeah something about the two or more gathered yeah exactly there yeah you know what i mean like yeah and we talked about that you know, when we, when we first talked, there's, there's something like the two or more gathered, you know, that it, it, there's something to that, man, that that's, that's like a mystery that that only gets unlocked when you're in that situation, you know? And I think as, as often as the, the sorcerer is portrayed as being this solitary figure, mm-hmm. which can be true, you know, and I think that archetypally it makes sense, but magic does really seem to have, just far greater potency as a community action. Yeah. yeah. Which leads me to um, a thing that I know that you were passionate about wanting to talk about common attitudes these days towards uh, lodge magic that you see being. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that some? Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, being like, you know, I was lodge magic is my foundation, you know, it's my foundation and things are a lot different than they were when I first got started. And when a lot of people got started into magic where for some, and for many people there, you know, who knows, like their, their first, their first um, exposure 
to, to doing any sort of like magic came in the form of like being part of a, an initiatory order, you know, or a fraternal order. And, and we don't need, like, things are different now. We have access to a lot of, a lot of shit that we didn't have access to before. But as someone who is a lodge magician, there are, there are certain things that certain skills and certain things that get developed and can only get developed within a lodge based system, you know, like, for instance, I can't talk about the stuff that I do at my school, but I can talk, which is a part of the problem. Like, you know, if you're in a lodge, like if you're in a degree-based system or a grade-based system, you you have things that you have obligations. You can't talk about certain stuff, you know, um, but I, and I think that's part of the challenge. I think, I think being bound by an oath of secrecy, it's up to the magician to, to, to draw parallels between what they're doing in the lodge and the way that what they're doing in the lodge informs the other work that they're doing. Like there's some stuff that isn't going to cross over, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, you know, specifically if you're working within a golden dawn based system, you know, there, there is going to be a lot of stuff that completely directly translates over to working through spirits. And it's up to the magician themselves, you know, to, to do the, do the looking and do the work to, um, to see what the crossovers are so that it creates like this feedback loop, like your spirit work now informs your lodge magic work and your lodge magic work informs your spirit work, you know, and that's, that's, that's the responsibility of the magician. But my point is that there is some there, you know, lodge magic and magical orders. They, they aren't like, there's some, there's a lot of utility to them and it, but it's up to the, it's up to the, the individual operator to, to be able to extract and, and function from principles that they, you know, that, that they learn and that they're exposed to while they're in a lodge, you know, and be able to translate and work from those principles outside of the lodge system, you know, in a way that, in a way that like informs the work without creating like an artificial crossover, you know? So I, I just, you know, I like, you know, I see a lot of people that I respect, you know, espouse uh like this opinion that you know lodge like lodge based magic is is futile or it's dead or it's this or it's that and i'm like nah man the lodge magicians just maybe we just don't want to talk about this shit publicly you know what i'm saying or maybe maybe we haven't gotten to the place where we can talk about it cogently in a way that demonstrates the value of going through a lodge based system you know so I I wanted to make a point to co- to make that comment, being somebody who, you know, has spent a majority of their time practicing magic within a lodge based system, and is now dealing with, grappling with, and learning how to extract the principles that are directly applicable to working within you know within a particular within the, a grimoire you know or or working with a spirit based you know working with spirits so to speak. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention here? Um, no, nah, just thank you, man. Thank you for, you know, for creating this podcast, man. I was, as, as like I said, when we talked, bro, I, like as soon as I heard the pilot episode and I heard Mo's episode, you know, I was so, I was really impressed. I was very entertained, you know, and I just thank you for just giving me the platform to talk about something that I love. You know, I love this shit. I want to give a shout out to Adley Nichols. You know what I'm saying? Everybody should definitely go check out his website, adleysmagic.com. He's got the bomb ass Heptameron course up there that really, really, you know, once I did that, once I did his course, man, shit just really took off. So I really, I have to give credit where credit is due. You know what I'm saying? So definitely want to give Adley a shout out. Check out his website, adleysmagic.com and specifically check out his Heptameron course up there because it's fire. And, you know, if you're in need of your practice, you're a practicing grimoire magician and you need some stuff, he's got some, he's got some dope stuff on his, on his website uh, for you as well. So anyway, thanks, man. This, uh, this was dope. Really appreciate it. And just looking forward to the next time that we get to do this.